Okay, today we're going to talk about conditional statements. This is super important. I'm going to write this sentence down here. If 4,686 is divisible by 6, Then, 4,686 is divisible by 3. Okay, let's look at that sentence for a minute. Okay. Now... Is 4686 divisible by 6? Well, the bottom line for today's discussion is who cares? Because it's not asking if it's divisible by 6 or not. The important thing here is the if then. If then. This sentence is not at all discussing whether or not 4686 is divisible by 6. It is simply saying that if that were the case, then something else would also be true, that it would also be divisible by 3. Okay? Another example is if you were to say, if it's raining tomorrow, then I will wear a jacket. Okay? And I want you to notice that that sentence, if it's raining tomorrow, then I will wear a jacket, says absolutely nothing about whether or not it's going to rain tomorrow. It doesn't tell me if it's going to rain tomorrow. Let me write that down. If it's raining tomorrow... then I will wear a jacket. Okay, so you see that is not at all saying anything about whether or not it's going to rain tomorrow. It is simply saying, there's it's simply saying this, there's two possibilities. One possibility is that it's raining tomorrow and another possibility is that it's not. And this is simply saying, in the possibility that it is raining tomorrow, then you can be sure that something else is also going to happen, which is that I'm going to be wearing a jacket. You see, that's the logical structure here is if, then. Okay? This is a statement, right? I'm going to underline this. 4686 is divisible by 6. That's a statement. Because it's either true or false. It happens to be true. Okay? But again, that's not important to us right now. But I do want you to notice that it is a statement. So let's call that one P. And this is also a statement. 4686 is divisible by 3. That's also a statement. Let's call that Q. Okay. We could do the same thing with the next sentence down. We could take it's raining tomorrow and we could call that P. And I will wear a jacket. I mean, if you wanted to be a little bit more specific, I guess I could say I will be wearing a jacket tomorrow. Okay. And we can call that Q. Those are both statements by themselves. Each one is a statement. And I have glued them together and made a bigger statement out of them. Okay. That means that the pair of words, if, then, 
is a connective. One connective made up of two words because I have connected two statements with the words if then and I've made a bigger statement. Okay? All right. So the truth or let let me actually say this. The individual truth or falsity or another way of saying that is the individual truth value okay of p and q are not important here okay the only thing that's important is how is the truth or falsity of Q related to that of P. Okay. Now, this is called a conditional statement. And I want to say, where does that word conditional come from? It comes from this. Let's look at the first example. If 4686 is divisible by 6, then 4686 is divisible by 3. Okay, that's a statement. In order for that statement to be true, what would have to be the relationship between the truth value of P and Q? Let's actually look at that from the other, the other side of the coin. What would make that false? Okay, if 4686 is divisible by 6, then 4686 is divisible by 3. What would make that false? You know what would make that false is if 4686 is divisible by 6, but it is not divisible by 3, then that statement would be false. Okay, so, so therefore, if the statement's true, and P is true, then Q would also have to be true. Or another way of saying that is, if P is true, then in order for the whole statement to be true, we would also have to have Q be true. So the, the truth of P is conditional upon the truth of Q. Because if that statement is true, then you cannot have P be true, but Q be false. So the truth of P is conditional upon the truth of Q. <laughs> That's why it's called a conditional statement. It is also called an implication <clears throat> because a lot of times people say it this way. Instead of if P then Q, we can say P implies Q. Okay? Actually, there's a few ways I can think of saying. I'm going to write these out for you. So you could say if P then Q. Okay, and that's just like I wrote it up above. Another way of saying it is P implies Q. And so that's why these are also called implications. Another way that you will sometimes see it is Q 
hue if p. That's very rare to see it that way, but it is it is possible. Okay. And another way which is very, very rare is you could say um, P only if Q. Okay. But I don't want you to really give much thought at all to that third and fourth one that I've written right now. I want you to just think about the first two. In fact, I'm going to erase those other two. We'll come back to them may maybe later. Okay, but definitely if P then Q and P implies Q. Okay, you need to know that those are the same. And here's an even shorter way of saying it. You can say P arrow Q. Okay, remember how we learned some symbols last time? We learned that this is called negation and basically that means not, right? This is called conjunction and means and. This is called disjunction and means or. And now we learned a new one. The arrow is called implication and it means if then. Okay. And the first part, the statement that is in the first half of the implication is called the hypothesis. And the statement that is being implied is called the conclusion. Okay. Now, that's a statement form right there, correct? P implies Q. I've used variables, so that's called a statement form. Whether or not that's true depends upon the relationship between the truth or falsity of P related to that of Q. All right? So how do we figure out all of the different possibilities? We make a truth table. So let's do that. Let's make a truth table for this implication. Okay. Uh, hang on. I think it needs to be bigger. because we have two variables, so there's going to be eight rows. So let's do P, Q, and then we'll do P implies Q. Okay. We write down all eight possible combinations. Oh, I'm sorry, it's not eight, it's only four. What am I talking about? Okay. All right. So let's figure out what that column should look like. Okay. And what we're going to do is we're going to use an example to help us figure it out. So the book has this example, which is pretty good. If you show up for work Monday morning, then you will get the job. If you show up for work Monday morning, then you will get the job. I would like to fit this all on one line, so let me let me write it like this.
So pretend you go to a job interview and you have the interview and then the, the employer says this to you. Okay? So let's look at all four possible happenings. Okay? Of you showing up for work or not versus you getting the job or not. Let's look at all four possible combinations and decide in which one did the employer tell the truth or a falsity. Okay, so one possibility, which is this one right here, is you, you do show up for work Monday morning, okay? And what happens? They give you the job. Let's say that that happens, that combination. Would you say that the employer had told the truth? Well, it seems that they did exactly what they said would happen. And so we would say in that case, what they said was true. Okay. All right, now let's look at the other combina combination, the next one. You show up for work and they don't give you the job. Okay. Well, what would you think about what the employer had said during the interview? Would you say that he had been honest or that he had told a falsehood? Well, the evidence in this case would lead you to say that he had told a falsehood, right? He said if you showed up for work, you would get the job. And you showed up for work, but you didn't get the job. So what he said turns out to have been false. Okay. All right. Let's skip the next one for a minute and let's go down to the fourth one, the fourth possible combination. Which says what? It says you didn't show up for work and you didn't get the job. So would you say that the employer, what they had said during the interview was, was true or false? Well, I think that you would say that what they said was true. I mean, I certainly can't say it's false, right? They said that if you showed up for work, you would get the job. And then you did not show up for work and you didn't get the job. That doesn't contradict what they said, does it? So what they said you would still say that they had spoken the truth based upon the evidence we have, right? But I do want to point this out, though. A lot of people say, yeah, well, what happened is exactly what the boss said would happen. And it's actually not. It doesn't contradict what he said, but I just want to point out, the boss never said what would happen if you didn't show up. Okay, that's the thing that a lot of people misunderstand. A lot of people think that if the boss said, if you show up for work, then you'll get the job. A lot of people think that that means if you don't show up for work, you won't get the job. But I just want to point out that they never said that. They, in fact, never told you anything about what would happen if you didn't show up. Okay, because you have to think along those lines for us to do that third uh, row of the truth table. So the third row of the truth table is you don't show up for work, but they still give you the job.
Now, I don't want you to even think at all, well, why would they do that? Because that's not the question here. Okay? The information we're given is that's what happened. The only thing we need to do is to decide had the employer told the truth or not during the interview okay and this is i just want to repeat what i said a few minutes ago a lot of people are tempted to say that what the employer said during the interview was false because they think the employer said in order to get the job you have to show up for work monday morning but i want to point out and this is super important okay they never said that they never said in order to get the job you have to show up for work. They simply said that if you do show up for work, then you will get the job. They actually said nothing at all about what would happen if you don't show up. They never mentioned that possibility. Okay? So there's no way for us in this combination... There's no way for us to say that the statement made during the job interview was false. There's no way for us to say that. But every statement is true or false. And so if it's not false, that means it has to be true. And there's absolutely nothing for us to base in this example of the third row there's no there's there is no way for us to claim that it was a false statement there's nothing for us to base that on okay so it's not false and if it's not false then it's true okay And a lot of times people hear that and they say, oh, so it's like everything's true unless you can prove it false. And that's that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, I'm not saying we can't prove this false. I'm saying it's not false. It was not contradicted by the reality. Okay? If you did not show up for work and they still gave you the job, you can't call the employer a liar because what happened... The reality did not contradict what they said during the interview. So what they said is not false in that case. And if it's not false, then it has to be true because every statement is either false or true. Okay? So that's the truth table for an implication. And I want to look at that truth table. And I want to point something out to you because we can learn a lot from that truth table. Look at the T's and F's that are here. And what do you notice? There's only one combination where an implication is false. And that is, if the hypothesis is true, and the conclusion's false, then the implication is false. In all other possible combinations, the implication is true. Okay? So, this is super important. A conditional statement is only false when the hypothesis is true and the conclusion is false. In all other cases,
the conditional statement is true. And you guys have to know that, okay? That's something that you need to learn. In these two cases down here, where the implication is true and the uh, hypothesis was false, a lot of times people say that the implication is true in that case because the hypothesis is false, which is not wrong. I don't particularly like thinking of it that way. I think it can be misleading, but it's not wrong. But a lot of times in those two cases, people say that the implication is vacuously true or true by default. Now I'll be honest with you, um, it, it's kind of nice to to use new words and things like that, but uh, I kind of don't like using those that term because here's the only danger of it. It tends to lead students to believe that those two truths are somehow not quite as important or quite as strong as this kind of true up here. And that would be wrong. I mean, true is true. There's no such thing as kind of true or more true than another true, which is less true. I mean, there, that, that doesn't exist, okay? True is true. And those two truths that we find in row three and four are just as strong as the true that we find in row one. But just so that you know, because you will see these words sometimes, that's what we call vacuously true. So if somebody if somebody tells you this, let's go back to the raining, okay? I say, where is it up there? If it's raining tomorrow, then I will wear a jacket. And the weatherman tells you, that statement is vacuously true. Then what do you know from that information? That means that the hypothesis is false. And so the weatherman is secretly telling you it's not going to rain tomorrow. Okay? But for the most part, you don't you don't need to worry about whether it's vacuously true or not. You just need to worry about is it true or not. But you might come across that word vacuously true. I just want you to know what it means. Okay. And I want to point out something else too. This goes back to something I said earlier. Remember I said that another way of writing this is writing um, Q only if P. And now that we have a truth table, I can kind of explain that a little bit better. Because in order for the sentence to be true... Oh, wait, hang on. I got my letters backwards. I'm sorry. I meant to say... I meant to say P only if... Q. Okay, so we can I can explain that a little bit better now looking at the truth table. So if that statement P implies Q is true, so that means for right now only look at the green rows. Okay, if you're only looking at the green rows, then the only time that P is true is only if what? only if Q is also true. You see that? Looking at the green rows only. P is only allowed to be true if Q is also true. So that's why 
if I say P if Q, that's the same thing as saying, oh, dang it, I keep switching my letters backwards, I'm sorry. I, I don't want to cause more confusion than you might have just on your own. So, so we have if P, then Q, which we can also write using symbols. Okay, so another way of saying if P, then Q, is we can say Q if P. Okay, because looking at the green rows only, we see that in the green rows, Q has to be true if P is true. So if P then Q can also be said Q if P, okay? But also you can say in the green rows, P is only true only if Q is also true, okay? So you can say P only if Q. That's not important by itself. It's only important when we put both of them together, which is going to happen later this week. That's the only reason I'm bringing it up. Okay. I apologize. I got the letters mixed backwards at first. And if I just confused you, then I will say, don't even worry about it because it is actually not important right now. Okay. All right. Now, we've learned a lot of connectives. There's four of them here, four connectives. And just like algebra and arithmetic, like plus, minus, multiply, and divide, you have to make sure that you observe the correct order of operations. OK, so let's talk about the order of operations of connectives. Now, of course, any question at all about order of operations can be solved instantly by using parentheses. But what if you're giving something that, given something that doesn't have parentheses? Like if I wanted you to do, if I wanted you to multiply 2 and 3 and subtract that from 10. Okay, then I could, I could certainly write this 2 times 3 in parentheses and subtract that from 10. And then there's absolutely no question whatsoever about what to do first, right? But, you know, let's be honest. I might not write those parentheses. I might just write 10 minus 2 times 3. And you are supposed to know... <coughs> Does that mean 8 times 3, which would be 24? Or does it mean 10 minus 6, which would be 4? Well, I certainly hope you know that it's 4. And why is that? Because there's an order of operations that says you do multiplication before subtraction, right? Okay, so same thing with logical connectives. Here's the order of operations. We do negations first, and then second row, or, or the second in line in the ordering is conjunctions and disjunctions. And implications last. So if there's multiple conjunctions and disjunctions, then there's going to need to be some parentheses, okay? Because they are in the same place in the order of operations, okay? So you see, if you see this, P or not Q 
implies not P. There's a lot of different ways that that could be understood, and only one of them is correct. Let's put in parentheses to show how things should be done. Okay? For instance, look at that negation right there. Is that the negation of Q? Or is that the negation of Q implies not P? Well, that's a good question. It could go either way, couldn't it? So you have to rely, rely upon your order of operations. That says you do negations before implications. And so what that tells you is that this negation right here, when I say to do that first, what I mean is it applies only to that thing right there. So I'm going to make that clear by putting parentheses around this. Okay. And it's not a bad idea for me to put them around the not P also, although there's no confusion there because there's, there isn't anything following the P that could cause any confusion. Okay, so that takes care of the negations. Now, there's a disjunction and an implication. Okay, which goes first? In other words, what I mean is this. Am I saying that P or not Q is implying P, uh, not P? Or am I saying that I either have P or I have not Q implies not P? It could be either one. Well, the order of operations say that disjunctions happen before implications, which means this disjunction right here gets applied first to these two things before you ever get to the implication. So let's put parentheses around that. And so that's how it goes. Okay? So you have the disjunction of P and the negation of Q. is implying the negation of P. Okay? All right, one more thing. What are some equivalent ways of saying implication? So I'm going to write logical equivalences involving implication. Okay? All right, so here's what I would like to do. I would like to show you that P implies Q is equivalent to not P or Q. Those are equivalent. And I want to show you that. How do I show the equivalence? With the truth table. Okay, so our variables are P and Q. And then we're going to have <clears throat> a column for P implies Q, which we already have done this truth table up above, so I already know how that column looks. Okay, and then we're going to do, so let's separate that. Okay, 
and then we're going to worry about that guy. So we'll put a column for not p, and then we can do not p or q. Okay, so let's fill this in. Oops. Okay, so we already did the next column right up here in that truth table. And what did we say? We said P implies Q is true unless P is true and Q is false. Okay, so that takes care of that column. Now, let's fill in the column for the negation of P. When P is true, the negation of P is false. When P is false, the negation of P is true. Now, the last column, which is important one for us, it's the negation of P disjunction with Q. So I need to look at the negation of P disjunction with Q. In order to fill in this column, you need to remember the rules for disjunction. Remember that you're going to have to look back at the last lecture if you don't remember, okay? Remember that a disjunction is true when one or both components are true. So in the first row, Q is true, and that's enough to make the disjunction true. In the second row, Q is false, and the negation of P is also false, and so that makes the disjunction false. And in the next row, Q is true, and so is the negation of P. And that makes the, oops, sorry, that makes the disjunction true. And in the last row, Q is false, but the negation of P is true, and that's enough to make the disjunction true. Okay? And let us compare this column. with this column. Notice that they are identical, which means that statement is logically equivalent to this statement. And that's important, and you're going to need to know that. Now, here's one that people don't um, always get right. This one's not going to be a logical equivalent. It's going to be a logical inequivalent. If we have P implies Q. Okay. And then we end up with not P. Does that imply not Q? In other words, are those two equivalent? That's the question. And if, you, if you're clever enough, you might realize that we've already discussed this when we were talking about getting the job on Monday morning. Okay? The truth is that a lot of people think those are equivalent, but they're actually not equivalent. Let me show you that they're not equivalent. It's very easy. All you have to do is make a truth table. Okay, so let's put P and Q, and then we'll do a column for P implies Q. By now, this should start getting pretty repetitive, so you could fill in that far so far pretty quickly. Okay, and then we'll do not P, and we'll do not Q, and then we'll use those to do a column for not P implies not Q. So let's fill this in.
So now this should be pretty routine for you to get up to that point. Okay. Now let's do this column. When P is true, the negation of P is false. When P is false, the negation of P is true. Let's do this column. When Q is true, the negation of Q is false. And when Q is false, the negation of Q is true. And now let's do the last column. Not P implies not Q. Okay, so that's an implication. Remember, an implication is always true except in the one case where the hypothesis is true and the conclusion is false. Where's the only time that happens? Right here. Hypothesis is true, conclusion is false, so the implication will be false. And in all other cases, the implication is true. Now look, these do not match. So these statements are not equivalent. Okay? This statement is called the inverse of that statement. And it's important for us to know that they are not logically equivalent. Okay? All right, let's look at another possibility. Now I want to look at this one that I had originally written down. P implies Q and the negation of Q implies the negation of P. Are those equivalent? Well, let's see. We'll make a truth table. P, Q, P implies Q. The negation of Q, the negation of P, the negation of Q implies the negation of P. Okay. And now, like I said, and this is, this is important, these truth tables should start to become very routine to you. I'm going to start filling them in faster, okay, because they should be becoming very routine. Put all four possible combinations here for our variables. Okay, this is now the third or fourth time we've done this next column. So you should know that it's true, false, true, true. Now if I did these in some sort of a different order, then that's going to change the order in here. So I don't want you to just memorize true, false, true, true. I want you to memorize what is the relationship between those and these. Okay? And then if you're careful and you always start the table in the same ordering, then you'll know that the next column is what is easy to memorize for you. Okay? If you're consistent, then you can memorize how it goes. Okay. Now, the negation of Q. When Q is true, the negation of Q is false. When Q is false, the negation of Q is true. When P is true, the negation of P is false. And when P is false, the negation of P is true. Here I have an implication. The only time an implication is false is when the hypothesis is true and the conclusion is false.
that makes the implication false. In all other cases, the implication is true. And now we compare this column and this column. And what do we see? They're identical. So that statement is equivalent to that statement. This is called the contrapositive of this. They are contrapositives of each other. Contrapositives are logically equivalent. Okay, and then there's one more I want to do. I don't know if you've been noticing which different possible combinations we've done and not done, but we started with P implies Q, and then we looked at, uh, sorry, hang on a second. Okay, and then we looked at this one by keeping the order the same but negating both. That gives you the inverse, and it is not equivalent to the original statement. Here we negated both and changed the order. That gives you contrapositive, and that is equivalent to the original statement. Can you see one other possible change I might want to make? That's keeping the order different but not negating them. So it'll be Q implies P. Let's compare that to P implies Q. So we're comparing Q implies P to P implies Q. Those are called converse of each other. Are they equivalent. Well, we'll make a truth table and see. This truth table will be a little shorter because there's no uh, negations to worry about. So we're going to have fewer columns. We just have four columns, P, Q, and then the implication in this direction, and then the implication in the other direction. Okay, implication is only false when the hypothesis is true and the conclusion is false. And I can say the same thing for the next column. It's also an implication. It's only false when the hypothesis is true. The hypothesis of this one is Q. And the conclusion is false. That's the only time the implications false. All other times it's true. Okay, compare these two columns. You see that they don't match. So these are not equivalent. Okay. And that's called the converse of this. And I have an example that I like to use that very clearly shows that converses aren't equivalent. Let's have P be the statement, my car is out of gas, and we'll have Q be the statement, my car won't run. If my car is out of gas, then my car will not run. That's a true statement. But the converse is, if my car won't run, then my car is out of gas. That's not a true statement. So you see, a, an in, a, a implication and its converse are not equivalent. But by the way, you might be interested in knowing this. We can take, let's see if this will work here. I'm not sure if this will work, but what if I just took that 
And let's see if we can just move that right up here. What do you notice about those two? Here and here. I know the scaling's a little off. Let me see if I can adjust that for you. Let's see here. There we go. That's a little better. So what do you notice about those two? They're the same, aren't they? So what's that tell you? It tells you that the inverse is logically equivalent to the converse. So let's make a table of this. I'm going to move that back down to where it was. Okay, so let's make a chart. Okay, so we have an implication. Okay, it's contrapositive. is where you negate both pieces and change the direction of implication. It's converse is when you change the direction of implication but you don't do any negating. And it's inverse is when you negate both pieces but don't change the direction of implication. And what you should know is that these two are equivalent. An implication and its contrapositive are equivalent. You should know that the converse and inverse are equivalent to each other. But the converse and inverse are not equivalent to the original statement and its implication. Okay, that's what you should know about that. You're going to need to know all four of those and which ones are equivalent to each other and which ones aren't. And here's another little piece of trivia. It just so happens that the, the uh, inverse is the contrapositive of the converse. And that's another reason why the inverse and the converse are equivalent. Okay? It's a lot of information in this lecture, but it's crucial. You need to know it. And there's more to talk about, too. But um, I'm going to end this lecture because it's getting lengthy, and then we'll continue in the next lecture.